Hello, uh, my name's Elise, and I'm going to be uh, leading us in the Bible reading tonight, which comes from Ezra 7, is where we'll be starting, and that's on page 737 in your pew Bibles. Starting from Ezra 7. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Artib, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Marioth, the son of Zeruiah, the son of Uzai, the son of Bukai, the son of Abishua, the son of Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra, came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord, his God, was on him. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, and to, its, to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. This is a copy of the letter King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, teacher of the law of the God of heaven, greetings. Now I decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites, who volunteer to go to Jerusalem with you, may go. You are sent by the king and his seven advisers to inquire about Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God which is in your hand. Moreover, you are to take with you the silver and gold that the king and his advisers have freely given to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, together with all the silver and gold you may obtain from the province of Babylon, as well as the free will offerings of the people and priests for the temple of their God in Jerusalem. With this money, be sure to buy bulls, rams, and male lambs, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, and sacrifice them on the altar of the temple of your God in Jerusalem. You and your fellow Israelites may then do whatever seems best with the rest of the silver and gold, in accordance with the will of your God. Deliver to the God of Jerusalem all the articles entrusted to you for worship in the temple of your God, and anything else needed for the temple of your God, of your God that you're responsible to supply, you may provide from the royal treasury. Now I, King Artaxerxes, decree that all the treasurers of Trans-Euphrates are to provide with diligence whatever Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law of the God of heaven may ask of you, up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of olive oil, and salt without limit. Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, let it be done with diligence for the temple of the God of heaven. Why should his wrath fall on the realm of the king and of his sons? You are also to know that you have no authority to impose taxes, tribute, or duty on any of the priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, temple servants, or other workers at this house of God. And you, Ezra, in accordance with the wisdom of your God, which you possess, appoint magistrates and judges to administer justice to all the people of Trans-Euphrates, all who know the laws of your God, and you are to teach any who do not know them. Whoever does not obey the law of your God and the law of the king must surely be punished by death, banishment, confiscation of property, or imprisonment. Praise be to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who has put into the king's heart to bring honour to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way, and who has extended his good favour to me before the king and his advisers and all the king's powerful officials. 
Because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. And we're going to skip a little bit ahead to 8.21. So we're starting at chapter 8, verse, starting at verse 21. There, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. Then I set apart 12 of the leading priests, namely Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 of their brothers. And I weighed out to them the offering of silver and gold and the articles that the king, his advisors, his officials, and all Israel present there had donated for the house of our God. I weighed out to them 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold valued at 1,000 darics, and two fine articles of polished bronze as precious as gold. I said to them, you as well as these articles are consecrated to the Lord. The silver and gold are a freewill offering to the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Guard them carefully until you weigh them out in the chambers of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem before the leading priests and the Levites and the family heads of Israel. Then the priests and Levites received the silver and gold and sacred articles that had been weighed out to be taken to the house of our God in Jerusalem. On the twelfth day of the first month, we set out from the Ahava Canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. So we arrived in Jerusalem, where we rested three days. On the fourth day, in the house of our God, we weighed out the silver and gold and the sacred articles into the hands of Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the priest. Eleazar, the son of Phinehas, was with him, and so were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Joshua, and Noadiah, son of Binui. Everything was accounted for by number and weight, and the entire weight was recorded at that time. Then the exiles who had returned from Cap captivity, suffered burnt, sacrificed burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 male lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's orders to the royal satraps and to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, who then gave assistance to the people and to the house of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Elise, for reading. I want us to start off tonight by thinking about someone that you know who's not a Christian. Have a think for a moment. Choose someone in particular, uh, maybe a friend, maybe someone in your family, maybe someone you work with. What would it take for that person to come and trust in Jesus? Perhaps you feel like if you could just ask them the right question at the right time or invite them to the right church event or give them the right book, then they would believe. Well, maybe. Or perhaps you feel like it's way too hard it would take an absolute miracle for them to change their mind. Well, the truth is, it's kind of both and neither. For someone to come and trust in Jesus, they need God to change their heart. Whether they appear really closed off from the gospel or whether they actually seem quite open to it. Either way, they won't come to believe unless God changes their heart. But on the other hand, for that person to come to trust in Jesus, they generally need a person to speak the gospel to them. I mean, it's possible that they could pick up a Bible of their own accord and read it and be saved. That has happened before. But normally, God works through other people. 
It's not as though you have to speak exactly the right word at exactly the right time. After all, God is at work, and it's God who changes people's hearts. But God usually works through people, and you may well be the way that God is going to make that happen. Well, we live in a very different time and a very different place to Ezra and the people that he was with. But our God is the same God. And the big thing that our passage tonight is trying to show us is that God is at work through people to achieve his purposes. That was the case back then, and it's still the case today. Now, the people of Jerusalem, they really needed to know that. As we've seen, the books of Ezra and on into Nehemiah as a whole, they are about how God is, worship, uh, God is rebuilding his worshipping community in Jerusalem. But as we've seen so far in Ezra, that process of God rebuilding his worshipping community has been pretty rocky. There's been a lot of ups and a lot of downs. On the one hand, some really great things have happened. Under Cyrus, the first group of Jews returned to Jerusalem and they built the foundations of the temple. And then under Darius, eventually they were able to finish the temple. But on the other hand, it's also been pretty hard. While they were working on the temple, they faced a lot of opposition from the trans euphradian authorities. That's kind of like their state government. They really didn't want them doing this work. And since that time, it's also been pretty hard. At one point, under the next king, Xerxes, the Jews almost got wiped out entirely. There's only a very brief mention in Ezra, but the full story is in the book of Esther, if you want to read about it. And now we're up to Xerxes' son, Artaxerxes, and we've not gotten off to a very good start. If you've been following along in Ezra for the past few weeks, you might remember that some of the events in Ezra are organised thematically rather than in strict chronological order. So back in chapter 4, the writer is talking about this theme of opposition, and he skips forward to a time that's later on to talk about this letter that was written to Artaxerxes. And where we are tonight at the start of chapter 7, that's just a little bit after this. And so back in that incident in chapter 4, the, the trans-Euphrates state government had sent this letter off to Artaxerxes and it cast the Jews in Jerusalem in a really bad light. Basically, it made it sound like they were fomenting some kind of rebellion. And so the king parroted back to them exactly the thing that they were looking for. These guys sound dodgy, stop the work. So as we start chapter 7, that's the situation we're still in. I want you to imagine that you're living in Jerusalem at the time. You are part of a minority people group. Food and resources are tight. Most of the city still lies in ruins. And you are just one small part on the edge of a great big empire, ruled by a king who lives miles and miles away, who doesn't really know what your situation is like, and so is able to be manipulated by your state government that is really hostile to you. What would it feel like to wake up every morning in that situation, not knowing whether today some official envoy is going to roll into town and change everything on you? They could demand more tax, they could knock down the work you've done, they could force you all to pick up and move on to somewhere else, or they could provide something to help you, you just, you just don't know. All that you do know is that you have very little control over what happens to you. You're really at the mercy of these forces that are outside of your control. So if you were a Jew living in Jerusalem in that context, what is it that you'd need to know? Well, you need to know that your God is at work. It is God who is rebuilding this worshipping community in Jerusalem. If he has purposed to do that, he is going to bring it about. He can do what people alone can't do. But you also need to know that he uses people like you to do his work. 
So if we put those two things together, God is at work through people to achieve his purposes. Now, if you believed that, you would have this kind of attitude that you would need to be able to keep going. A heart of calm persistence. Persistence, proactivity, because God is working through you to bring about his plan. But calm, not anxious, because you know that it's God who is working. So in this story tonight, we see a great example that shows how God works through people But at the same time, it's an example that shows that God himself is truly at work to achieve his purposes that people could never do by themselves. And we'll see how that attitude that the Jews in Jerusalem needed to have can inform our hearts and our actions as we live as God's people nowadays. So first of all, let's dig into how God works through people. We're remembering that the thing God is trying to do here is to rebuild this worshipping community in Jerusalem. Now, they've got a temple, but it seems like they probably don't have regular sacrificial worship going on, and they probably don't know the law very well. So what does God do? He sends them exactly the kind of person that they need. Let me read a few verses from the start of chapter 7. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of a whole bunch of people stretching back to Aaron, the chief priest, this Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher, well-versed in the law of Moses. So right at the start of the chapter, we are given two important bits of info about Ezra. These are Ezra's qualifications for the job. Ezra is a priest, and Ezra is a teacher of the law. Firstly, we are shown that Ezra is a priest through that quick genealogy at the start of the chapter. It's there to demonstrate that Ezra is the real deal. He's from the right priestly family. In order to reinstate regular sacrificial worship at this temple, they need a priest, and here we go, they have one, all legit. Secondly, Ezra is a teacher of the law, Uh, We're told that he was well-versed in the law of Moses. I think it's mildly amusing that somebody who knows their Bible is uh, well-versed in it. Uh, But anyway, we keep getting told this idea in multiple different ways. Uh, In verse 7, we're told that Ezra devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord. In verse 11, we're told that Ezra was learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord for Israel. So Ezra is dedicated to knowing the law, and he's devoted to observing the law. Also in verse 7, we read that he was devoted to teaching its decrees. So he's already got experience teaching. Ezra knows the law, he applies it in his own life, and he already has experience teaching others to do the same. So Ezra is exactly the kind of person that you'd pick for this job. And in case we missed it, we keep getting reminded of this through the chapter. Even as we read Artaxerxes' letter that he gives to Ezra, multiple times this pagan king refers to him as Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law. So how is God working here through ordinary human means? Well, here he's doing that by raising up exactly the right person for the job. The people of God in Jerusalem, they need a priest and a teacher so that they can properly become God's worshipping community. And lo and behold, that's exactly the person that God sends them. The section we read in chapter 8, all that talk about weighing out precious articles and so forth, that is there to show us that Ezra is a trustworthy person and that he is diligent. So God raises up the person he needs for the job and he works through Ezra's careful and trustworthy efforts to set up regular sacrificial worship in the community in Jerusalem. So this is God at work through people to achieve his purposes. 
Let's turn and have a look at the other side of that coin now, that it's God himself that is at work. Now, amongst all of the human activity that's going on in these chapters, with all the names and the places and the things, let's not miss the fact that this all happens because God is at work. And this is highlighted with that repeated phrase, the hand of the Lord was on his people. So chapter 7, verse 6, the hand of the Lord is on Ezra. And so the king gives him everything he asks. In verse 9, which summarises the journey, the gracious hand of his God was on him so that he did the whole journey in just four months. We hear that and we go, oh, wow, four months, that's a long time. But this is a very long journey. I think we're meant to react by going, wow, you, you went that whole way in just four months? Amazing. And on it goes in chapter 8. The hand of God means that they are able to convince a bunch of Levites to come with them. And the hand of God means that this journey through all sorts of rugged terrain is safe and that they are protected from bandits and robbers. While people are involved in so much of what goes on in these chapters, this repeated emphasis about the hand of the Lord shows us that it is really God who is at work behind the whole thing. None of this would have succeeded if the hand of the Lord was not behind it. At the end of chapter 7, we get a little bit more specific idea of what uh, the hand of the Lord has been doing. Uh, in verse 27 to 28, Ezra says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who has put it into the king's heart to bring honour to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way and who has extended his good favour to me before the king and his advisers and all the king's powerful officials. Did you catch that? The Lord has put it into the king's heart to honour the temple. The Lord has also extended his good favour before the king, which I think means that God has caused the king to look favourably upon Ezra. Now, Remember the situation we're in. Uh, remember what I talked about from uh, chapter 4 earlier. The start of Artaxerxes' reign was not a very promising start for the Jews in Jerusalem. The message that had been sent to Babylon was, these guys are rebels, stop them. And so the work stopped. So the fact that just a few years later, Ezra is able to ask Artaxerxes to fund this temple worship in Jerusalem and that he's given this letter with all this authority uh, to ask for resources, uh, and that he's able to even prevent the regional government from taxing those who work in the temple. This is all a huge turnaround from where we were before. The fact that a convoy of unarmed priests and Levites with hundreds of animals loaded up with treasure was able to journey for four months and not get robbed and everything made it safely to Jerusalem, this also is a huge accomplishment that could have turned out, very easily could have turned out quite differently. So praise be to the Lord that he accomplished this, which is such a big step towards the goal of restoring his worshipping community in Jerusalem. Ezra may have been the right person for the job, but without the hand of the Lord, that wouldn't have been enough to change the king's heart in such a profound way. So what does this story mean for the original readers of the book of Ezra? Well, this was written down and they were probably reading this a little bit later, maybe the next generation or two down the line. But their situation would have been pretty similar. Just like the Jews in Jerusalem at the time of Ezra himself, the original readers of this book, shortly after, were very much at the mercy of the whims of the empire. Sometimes it went well for them, sometimes terrible things happened to them. So this passage is written down for them to give them that calm perseverance that comes from knowing that God is at work through people to achieve his purposes. They can be calm because it is God who is at work. And God wants to see his worshipping community in Jerusalem continue. But they can also be persistent because God is using them to achieve his purposes. 
But what does that look like for us now? Well, I've said that in Ezra and Nehemiah, God is rebuilding his worshipping community in Jerusalem. What purpose is God working to achieve nowadays? This is an important question, because if we get that question wrong, we might misapply this passage in all sorts of problematic ways. You know, if we try and draw, draw too direct of a line from Israel to the church now, we might think that God is trying to build up particular nations into Christian countries, and so we might get all caught up in politics or so forth. Uh, you know, or perhaps we might think that God is focused on blessing individual Christians with worldly goods, and so we're looking for him to build up our bank accounts or something. But these are not the main purposes that God is working towards today. What God is doing in the world is building his worshipping community in the heavenly Jerusalem. God is bringing people from all corners of the earth into this worshipping community before his throne. Have a listen to how Peter describes it in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, As you come to him, that's Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Just a little bit later, he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The church is God's worshipping community, and it consists of all believers everywhere. When we gather here as a local church, we are just a microcosm of that heavenly reality that all Christians belong to, that spiritual house, that holy priesthood. This is what God is building now. It's not a bricks and mortar temple on earth, in one location for one particular nation or group of people. God is building a heavenly temple where all of his people across time and space worship him and will continue doing so into eternity. How is God building this temple? We'll have a listen to Jesus' great commission at the end of Matthew. This is the last thing he says to his disciples before his ascension. He says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Just like when God built his little worshipping community in Jerusalem, God is at work through people. Jesus' disciples, they are told to go and make more disciples. But they are not trying to do this by themselves. Jesus assures them that he is with them always, to the very end of the age. We saw this earlier in the year when we were looking at the book of Acts. It's a book about what Jesus continued to do and teach through his people. To use the language of Ezra, the hand of Jesus is on his people, working through their efforts so that God's purpose is achieved. So where does that put us? God is still building his heavenly worshipping community. God is still at work, and he still works through people to achieve his purposes. And so that means that as God's people today, we too can have hearts of calm persistence. Persistence in holding on to Jesus. Persistence in telling people about Jesus and in building up our fellow Christians. But we can do this calmly, not anxiously, knowing that it is God who is at work. Sometimes it can seem that uh, staying a Christian can be really difficult. There are so many temptations and distractions that threaten to turn us off the path. But the God who blessed Ezra and co. with safe travel on the long road to Jerusalem 
is the God who gives us perseverance to hold on to him through the long journey of life in this world. It might seem like there are people that you know who are so closed off to the gospel that they would never believe. Perhaps that's the person you were thinking of at the start. But the God who put it into Artaxerxes' heart to honour the temple in Jerusalem is the same God who today puts the gospel into, the, into people's hearts, even the hardest hearts of people. If we believe that God is really at work in the world, then we don't need to be anxious about whether we said exactly the right thing at exactly the right time in order for that person to trust him. If we believe that God really works through us, we can have that calm persistence. This attitude should prompt us to pray, uh, pray expectantly and to build diligently. So if you pray for someone who is not a Christian to know and love Jesus, again, maybe that person you were thinking of at the start, if you're doing that, you are expressing the fact that it is God who is at work building his church. If you speak to that person and you ask them to consider Jesus or to read the Bible with you, then you are taking part in God's building process and God is at work through you. Or to take another example, if you pray for another Christian to keep persevering in their faith, you're expressing the fact that it is God who is at work in their life. If you meet up with that other Christian and ask them how their faith is going and encourage them to hold on to Jesus, then you are taking part in God's building process and God is at work through you. It's really great to see uh, how much of this sort of encouragement happens at All Saints. Uh, Often it's quite quiet. Uh, Ben and Joss might not even know that it happens. Um, But it's great to see how God works through people here to build up his church. So as we pray, pray expectantly. As we build, build up the church, build diligently. Compared to Ezra, we live in a very different time in history. But God is the same. And we can still have that calm persistence because God is still at work and he still works through people to achieve his purposes. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are God over all and that you are building your church gathering your people in every time and place to worship you. We thank you for involving us in your work, that as well as being recipients of your grace, we are also given the chance to share it with others by speaking the gospel to those who don't know you and by building up our brothers and sisters. We also thank you that you don't leave us to try to do that on our own. You are at work in the world by your spirit, putting your gospel into people's hearts. Please, Lord, give us that calm persistence that comes from knowing that you are at work through us. Please encourage us by helping us to see the ways that you are at work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.